as we prepare to hear the word of God, let us pray. Holy God, speak your word. Let those who hear guard the good treasure and trust it to them with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us all. Amen. I'll be reading passages from um, the book of Proverbs, all of chapter 4, um, from the Gospel, John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21, and then from Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 8, verses 9 through 17. And I realize that this is a lot of scripture, but I narrowed it down. <laughs> and so um, we hear from, uh, from Solomon in the book of Proverbs. He writes, My children, listen when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment, for I'm giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instructions, for I too was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, take my words to heart, follow my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom, develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will place a lovely wreath on your head. She will present you with a beautiful crown. My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a good, long, a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's way and lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you, will not, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. Don't do as the wicked do, and don't follow the path of evildoers. Don't even think about it. Don't go that way. Turn away and keep moving, for evil people can't sleep until, they are done, until they've done their evil deed for the day. They can't rest until they've caused someone to stumble. They eat the food of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The way of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, which shines ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like total darkness. They have no idea what they are stumbling over. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. And then now from the Gospel of John, and this is Jesus speaking, and he is speaking, he is on his way to the cross, having already eaten the last meal, uh, the Passover with his disciples, and he says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. For he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And since I live, you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. And then from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 9 through 17. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. 
But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. This is God's word for us today and for all people everywhere, for all time. Thanks be to God. Normally I, I, I dive in and then I stop to pray, but I want to, to stop to pray right now before I dive in. Mighty and awesome God, your word, your word is, is trustworthy, it's true. It gives us life and abundant life. And so God, as we are here today, I, I just pray that your word would sit deep in our hearts, that, that we would come to a new and fuller understanding of that which you have spoken to us and in those ways which you have called us to live. Holy Spirit, move in power, speak in us and to us, speak in me and to me and through me and in spite of me. And may the words of my, my mouth and, and all of our thoughts be in line with your heart, with your will, with your desire. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I just realized that I didn't have the, the lyrics uh, to the second verse. Uh, we are continuing in uh, a series uh, with Be Thou My Vision as our, uh, as our guidepost. And the, we look at the second verse today. I would say our hymnal is missing a verse, and I don't remember which one it is. Uh, but this verse uh, is Be Thou My Vision and Thou My True Word. I ever with you and thou with me, Lord. You're my great father, and I your true child. You, you ever, you dwell within me. Oh my goodness. Anna, look that up and see if that's the verse. <laughs> but nonetheless, be thou my vision, and be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. Now you might be familiar with the phrase, the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, the phrase is used to imply an exceptional amount of of wisdom, especially in the face of a difficult situation. Uh, for example, if this new product isn't a success, it will take the wisdom of Solomon to come up with a strategy that can save the business. We come to know the story behind the saying, the wisdom of Solomon, when we find ourselves in the Old Testament, First uh, Kings chapter 3. Now, you might recognize the name of Solomon. It's a name from the Bible. You might know that Solomon was King David's son, King David and Bathsheba, and would also become king of Israel. You might even know that Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. But do you know why the wisdom of Solomon is even a thing? Now, Solomon had taken his place as king of Israel, and, and at that one night, the Lord spoke to him and asked, What do you want? Imagine the God of the universe asking you, what do you want? Anything. Anything. You can have anything. What would you ask for? Well, success, intelligence, love, health, safety, fame. Well, Solomon asked for wisdom. You see, Solomon recognized as king of Israel, he needed help. He was in way over his head, and he noted his inadequacy. He said to the Lord, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous, they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself can govern the great people of yours? <laughs> I imagine God might say, good answer, kid, good answer. His reply was, the Lord was pleased, well, says, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God said, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for a long life or wealth, um, or and the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has had 
or ever will have. <laughs> cool beans. Imagine God giving us a wise and understanding heart, one which would know the difference between right and wrong, one which could be nearer to the heart of God, whose ways are not our ways, whose thoughts are not our thoughts, whose ways are higher than our ways, and, and thoughts higher than our thoughts. Uh, you hear that word in Isaiah. But the saying, the wisdom of Solomon, it didn't even come from God's granting Solomon what he had asked for. Instead, Solomon, right off the bat, demonstrated his wise, understanding heart. And you might be familiar with this story. You see, there were two women. We're going to call them woman A and woman B. And these women came to Solomon with a dispute. They had been living in the same house, and both had, had given birth to baby boys within a few days of one another. And unfortunately, woman B's son died in the night she, she rolled over on him. But uh, distraught, <laughs> this woman, woman B, took her dead son and, and put it in the arms of woman A and took woman A's living son and put it in her arms. And when they woke up the next morning, you know, woman B was like, or woman A's like, oh my goodness. And, you know, my son has died, but, but this isn't my son. And so they started fighting back and forth. And so they took this to, to King Solomon. And um, Solomon was to decide... Who gets the baby? Back and forth. The living child is mine. No, he's mine. The living child is mine. No, he's mine. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So Solomon says, wait, 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 wait. Would you guys, would you bring me my, my sword? And so his sword was brought to him. And he says, you know, I'm going to cut this baby in half. So each woman can have a piece of the child. Like, Lord, in your mercy. Now this solution seems gruesome, more gruesome than it seems wise. Well, woman A, the real mother of the living child, looked on with horror and relented, for she loved her son very much. She didn't want to see him killed, of course. And so she said "Get to Solomon, just give her the child. Please, don't kill him. And woman B, heartless, well, she'd already demonstrated that. She says, all right, he will neither be yours nor mine. Go ahead, Solomon, divide him between us. Can you imagine? Well... Solomon uh, then just took the baby and handed it to woman A. I said, obviously your kid, because you love this child and you didn't want this child to die. What a wise guy. Be thou my wisdom. Solomon, knowing that he could not lead the people of Israel by his own intelligence, power, and strength, he called on the one who could. He hadn't asked for riches and fame, though God would grant him those things as well as a long life if he would keep the decrees and commandments of the Lord. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. Full disclosure, Solomon would later choose to be foolish, to choose the wisdom of this world over the wisdom that the Lord had given him. In the last decade of his life, he would write the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, presumably to his children, uh, as a reflection on his life. Solomon, in that he found wisdom uh, and foolishness to meet the same end, death. He recognized, though, that, that that was the wisdom of the world and the foolishness of the world that would end in death. He recognized that following the wisdom of the world, which he married a lot of women, and he married them to create political alliances with other countries, and then he would alienate and oppress those he was supposed to rule uh, in order to build his wealth and fame. And he recognized that that wisdom, that following what the world says is, says is good and right, didn't bring him security. It didn't bring him the contentment he longed for. You see, life's opportunities and successes without the pursuit of God, and without God being wisdom, is in vain. It's temporary. Security and contentment can only be found in a personal relationship with God. With God being our vision, with God being our wisdom, with God being our true word, which was spoken in the law in the Old Testament and was demonstrated in the life of Jesus, the word made flesh, the way, the truth, and the life. Life lessons were not only learned for Solomon, not only written down for his children and for the people of Israel, they are life lessons for us today and for our lifetime. And the book of Proverbs, which we read from today, is also attributed to Solomon. It is classified as a book of wisdom. And let me confess, I don't really like Proverbs. It, it just is like, it feels like the string of, of phrases put together with no rhyme or reason. But anyway, chapter 4. And in chapter 4, Solomon is pleading with his children and all who would read this to, to get wisdom, to develop good judgment. And, and 
just really quickly, I know that it uses she when it's talking about wisdom. Don't, don't get hung up on that. Um, in, in, in the Hebrew, wisdom is a feminine noun, uh, and, and we recognize that though God is Father and Jesus is male, um, male and female were created in God's image. God has no gender, but anyway, anyway. We come to chapter 4 in Solomon's just go after wisdom, just go after wisdom, and, and, and follow the ways of God. Don't follow the ways of the wicked. And, you, and, and then Solomon continues to tell us how to pursue wisdom. And you think I repeat myself? Did you hear how often he repeated himself in this one chapter? Over and over and over. Wisdom comes in following the ways of God. and following the ways of God's command. He says, don't get sidetracked. Stay on the straight and narrow. And, and you know, throughout Scripture, it talks about that. You know, Jesus is, uh, is the way that leads to life. Narrow is the path that, ways to lead to, that leads to life. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. Uh, God telling uh, J- Joshua when he's headed into the promised land, keep my commands, don't go to the left or to the right. Um, and then in the prophets, I stand at the crossroads and look, and I ask which way, uh, which way um, is the ancient way is the, the, the word of God. And I go in that direction following the commands of God, walking the straight and narrow. That's what brings wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, of course. Our pursuit is to be the kingdom of God. Our pursuit is to be loved by God, uh, to love God and to share God's love everywhere to everyone and to live the abundant and eternal life that God offers us here and now through faith in Jesus Christ. Our pursuit isn't to be for the things of this world. And Paul wrote wrote to the church uh, that the cross is foolishness, foolishness to the wise, for those whose wisdom is based on what the world understands as good and right. Look around, folks, at what the world considers good and right, and look at the mess we've gotten ourselves into. And... You know, the, the, and the idea that the wisdom of this world, that, that determines a person's success, a person's worth, versus being called a child of God, no longer slaves. The wisdom of God is foolishness. It doesn't make sense to those who do not believe. I mean, think about it. The, the wisdom of God, God's true word, it calls, it calls us to turn the other cheek, to walk the extra mile, uh, to, to give our, our, our coat up, our shirt up for someone in need. The wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world says seek God's kingdom first. Not the wealth, not the power, not the success uh, that the world says you need to be somebody. The wisdom of God calls us to deny ourselves to take up our cross? For what does it profit a person to gain the whole world but to lose our, what does it profit us but to gain the whole world but to lose our own soul? The wisdom of God calls us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, to to wash feet, to to sell all we have and give to the poor, to gather together for, for worship and study and prayer and fellowship and communion on a daily basis because that is how the church grew in numbers. The cross is foolishness to those who are considered wise in this world. The wisdom of God, God's true word, calls us to to love sacrificially. It is a love that is patient and kind, that doesn't boast, that isn't rude, that puts others first, that's humble and not prideful. That just doesn't make sense in this world. Uh, This world in which one... uh, which people are often looking out and, and looking to have more and more and more and more and more and more and more. A world which puts me first, a world which puts family first, a world which puts God wherever he might fit in our schedule, in our checkbook. Well, yeah, some of y'all still use checks, right? <laughs> our bank account, right? The, the wisdom of God, God's true word, is written, is written in the laws and commands in the Old Testament. The wisdom of God, God's true word, is lived out and fulfilled through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament isn't made null and void. Jesus, the word, made flesh, the way, the truth, and the life. It's foolishness to those who seek fame and riches of this world. And those things are fleeting. They're temporary. You can't take them with you when you breathe your last breath. 
The way of wisdom is following Jesus, is following God's commands, is being holy as God is holy. And now, holiness is not about thou shalt and thou shalt not, this checklist of what's good and, and what's bad. But holiness is the ability to not live defeated lives, but to live lives of uh, vict victory. Lives as children of God. One of my favorite scripture passages, and, and we, um, we see it um, at funerals and at Easter, but it says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and law gives sin its power, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ, through belief, through faith, which, which is not just with our head, but is with our whole selves. And then, check out that passage that, that Paul writes to the Romans. I wanted to read all of it, but, you know, again. It says, you know, you're not controlled by that sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if it's living in you. And, and, and the verse in, in um, Be Thou My Vision talked about, um, you know, the, the Father dwelling in us. The Spirit living in you. Christ lives within you. And, and, and Jesus says that in the passage in John um, 14, and actually says it in John 15, and says it in John 10, that, that Jesus says, I and the Father are one, you know, and as I am in the Father, you are in me. Think about it. Paul continues to say, the Spirit gives you life. The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Folks, that's power. That's true power. And then, he says, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. I tell y'all that every week, and y'all, I, I, I don't believe that, right? We can choose not to consciously sin because the Holy Spirit is in us. And you know what? I fail at that every day. I failed at it this morning, I'm pretty sure. And I know that I failed at it because I didn't rely on the Holy Spirit. I didn't say, okay, I'm going to say no because I know that God will, will, you know, that I'll be okay if I say no. We have no obligation to do what our sinful nature urges us to do. For, for if you live by our, your sinful nature, you will die. And that doesn't mean your, your physical death right here and now. It means a life that isn't abundant. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and life abundantly. It says, but if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves, but you received God's Spirit in you when he adopted you as his own children, God's true child. And we can call him Abba, Father. That is a personal name. It means a personal relationship. And it says, God's spirit in us, joining our spirit, God dwelling in us, confirms that fact that we are God's children. Think about it. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. So. The way, the way of wisdom is following Jesus. We are children of God, no longer slaves. God calls to us. God speaks to us. God, God says, call me Abba, call me Father. Come to this throne of grace with confidence. That's in the book of Hebrews. And this is saying God, our Father, Abba, calls his children and says, hey, come sit on my lap. I'm in my easy chair. Come sit on my lap. And, and, and take a nap. Come sit in my lap and, and, and just sit. Come and tell me about your day. Tell me, tell me about your struggles. Tell me about what's good. Listen to, listen to, to me. When God is our wisdom, when God is our true word, we aren't slaves to sin. We have victory. We are God's child, and God is dwelling in us, giving us power. Be thou my wisdom and my true word. 
As I read through Proverbs 4, I couldn't help but see all of those places uh, where Solomon not only is calling us to wisdom, but is calling for God to be our vision, for us to be walking the straight paths. This is God's desire for us. It's God's desire for us. Do we want? Do we want it? Do we want it to be our desire? God asks us, just as he asked Solomon, what do you want? What do you want? May our answer be, I want you, God, to be my wisdom. I want you, God, to be my vision. I want you, God, to be my true word. I want to have that life, that abundant life, that eternal life that you have promised me here and now. We come to the table today. We, and when we come to the table today, we come, with, again, with people around the world. We come with an understanding that in the bread and in the cup is the broken body and the shed blood of Christ for the redemption of the world so that we might be made righteous. That is foolishness. Foolishness to those who, who believe they're wise in this world, to those who think that they can save themselves. We come with the world today to experience the grace of Jesus. And we come with God saying, what do you want? So may you come today to receive the bread and the cup. And as you come today to receive the bread and the cup, may you respond to God's question, what do you want? Or may you at least go, hmm. And, but I pray that your response will be, I want you, Jesus. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the desire of my heart. As we prepare to come to the table, I, I will pray. And, and those of you watching online, I, I do invite you also um, to celebrate Holy Communion with us. You indeed are a part of our community here today. And so... As, as we are preparing, I, I, you know, bread, crackers, uh, juice, or, or water, um, and so. Let us pray. God, you indeed are mighty and awesome, and you are worthy of all of our praise and thanksgiving. It is right and good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give you thanks. We give you thanks that you indeed have given us your word, that you have given us the opportunity to have your wisdom, to, to be led by your vision, to follow in your light that cannot be overcome by the darkness. We are thankful for, for the words of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and, and God, we are thankful. We are thankful that you humbled yourself, that you might even, that you would step out of heaven, step out of the glory of heaven to the mess of this earth, to live a, a life fully human, to show us what it means fully human, to be fully human. We do remember on that night that you gave yourself up for us, you showed us what it meant to love. You got on your knees and you wrapped yourself in a towel and you washed the feet of your disciples. Those, they all abandoned you, Lord. One betrayed you, one denied you, one doubted you. And yet, you still loved them. And then, you took bread and you gave thanks for thanksgiving is the beginning of the miracle. And you broke that bread and you gave it to your disciples and you said, Hey, eat. This is my body broken for you. And when the supper was over, you took the cup and you gave thanks and you gave it to your disciples and you said, Hey, drink. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. 
and so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, with all those around the world, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's sacrifice for us. Holy Spirit, come upon us, come upon these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with you, one with Christ Jesus, and one with each other in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at that heavenly banquet table. The world, all nations, every tongue, every nation, on our knees, confessing that you are Lord. Father Almighty, Jesus Christ, your only Son, and the Holy Spirit, living in us, giving us the victory. Amen. Though we are many, we are one in Christ Jesus. We partake of the one loaf. And this is the cup, the cup of the new covenant, the one in which we remember Christ's blood shed for us. And so, for those of you online, may you take the bread broken for you. May, we, may you drink from the cup Christ's blood shed for you. May you experience God's grace, and may you indeed answer the question, what do you want? With Lord, I want you to have all of me. I want you to be my wisdom and vision. And so as you go about your day and your week, may you go, may you go about that day with grace and peace, and may you go to be loved by God uh, with that never-ending, steadfast, um, incalculable love. And with that, may you love God, love yourself, love one another, share God's love everywhere to everyone, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, disciples will be made, this world will be transformed. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.